My name is Linda Eloa Mahonga. To those who do not know me yet, uh, we have invited you to come and join us for today's very first session for masters and doctoral students who are supposedly doing their studies for the very first time here at UNINSA. Uh, the idea is to meet with you and kind of get a feeling of what your challenges are and also to introduce our support services to you so that should you find yourself stuck, you know where to knock. We are the kind of support services in addition to what your colleges have to offer. Without wasting time, let me hand over to my colleague, Ms. Madima, Dombi Madima, to give you a broad outline of what our services entail. My name is Ndombi Madima. Um, uh, we are here to support you. Uh, basically, our um, program <coughs> that we support our students, it's uh, called Academic Literacy. Um, with Academic Literacy, we support you uh, in terms of saying, where is it that you find yourself not be able to move in your studies? And just to give you the overview, uh, what we as academic literacy uh, do, what, what, how do we uh, envisage to, to, you know, support you? Um, so now you might ask yourself, what is this um, academic literacy? Uh, I normally say, you know, the issue of writing or even starting from reading, it's a, it's a skill that needs to be imparted in all of us. Um, writing, reading is a skill. Writing is a skill. And sometimes we just assume that no man, everybody can read, everybody can write. And that is not the case. So this is where now we have this program called academic literacy. So academic literacy, uh, it refers to to be proficient in your qualitative and your quantitative qualitative will which will embrace reading and writing uh, students let let us be fair uh, the medium of instruction is english sometimes you know it is our fourth or our fifth or our third language so hence you need to be equipped with the skills to say how do i read with understanding how do i write you know concisely and you know, be able to understand what you are reading and what you are writing. So in this program, we help you with academic writing because we know that uh, the writing is the end product of when now you put whatever your thoughts into paper, into your research. So this is what we do. We assist you with academic writing. Of course, even if we even give you maybe the skills of saying, how do you read? But as masters and doctoral students, we know that you might have uh, acquired such skills. But um, I can assure you that uh, uh, with the, 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 the elements that I've indicated to say, you know, this language that uh, we are writing with sometimes, you know, is complex. You need somebody who can give you those strategies or even to refine them, to polish them so that you understand. So uh, what we do and then um, in academic literacy is a matter of applying application of the acquired knowledge from academic sub subjects into appropriate context. So when you will be doing your literature review and what have you, you need to apply the knowledge that you have uh, uh, acquired into an appropriate context. And this is where Dr. Korombi will be uh, taking you through to say, 
what are those steps? So the purpose of this session, uh, as Ms. Mahonga has uh, alluded, is just to conduct your needs analysis to say, what is it that you need? Where is it where you hit a, a brick wall? And then to say, oh my God, you know what? I don't know what to do here. So uh, the purpose of this session is for us to uh, link you with your facilitator, which is Dr. Korombe, uh, who is your facilitator. He is a very renowned researcher. Uh, actually, before he starts, I will ask him to just briefly give you his 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 background. He's um a research, you know, journey and stuff, so that you can understand that you are in good hands. So I have indicated that our duty is to assist you in academic writing process. Um, where you are stuck or stranded, maybe in terms of academic writing, then we are able to assist you uh, to reconstruct whatever that you have written, to reformat, uh, you know, whatever that you have written. And, and in those who were like in undergrad, like uh, honors and staff, you know, how do they reformat their assignments and portfolios and stuff? But we focus on the academic writing. Then Dr. Korombi will be the one who will give you the overview of all the aspects that has to do with research. So. I think with those uh, few words uh, from us, uh, I will hand over uh, to Dr. Korombi to uh, take you through the session uh, that he has prepared for you. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself, Konanani uh, Korombi. Uh, it has already been said that I'm Korombi. Um, I have got background in nature conservation. And I'm going to read uh, all those uh, classes that I've attended. And I start with uh, MTech in Nature Conservation from PE Technicon 2001. Master of Environmental Management uh, from 2004, um, Free State University. Master of Public Administration, Northwest University in 2019. Um, a Doctor of Technology uh, from TUT uh, in 2012. Um, DTEC and MTech and Master of Environmental Management projects have relevance to heritage resources management in my role as council member of the South African Heritage Resources Agency. Um, here, I'm just saying that as, as part of um, the public servant, um, I was also appointed to be a council member of, of one of the entities as a board member. But Master of Public Administration is the one that allowed me, um, the, it's the one that is very relevant to my uh, occupation since 1979 to this year in February. In other words, I have served as a public servant for 44 years. And um, in, in, in 2005, University of South Africa actually uh, appointed me as one of the part-time tutors and that is where I was focus focusing on plant studies. At that time, we were supporting uh, the undergrads, uh, plant studies one. And I might have done that until 2013 when I stopped. But I was again, um, I, I got another appointment in 2020, which did not materialize because of COVID. Uh, I'm just coming now or imaging uh, this year now with this program. That is my, my background. So the, the approach that I, I have adopted uh, for today is one uh, that, that can allow us to engage for the first time. Um, I know it is theory. It is a presentation that I prepared on the, the research process. Um, 
uh, let me put a disclaimer. I, I know that at master's and doctoral level, you're not interested on the on a lot a lot of talking or theoretical stuff. You want to apply principles of research in the field. You want to do the actual research by preparing a proposal, doing literature study, collecting empirical evidence, analyzing, interpreting data, making conclusions and all the recommendations. I know. And um, this session is intended to just start um, and our relationship and all the other things we can work outside when there is a matter that needs us to come together we organize similar sessions we will have a session like this then we can talk and discuss about matter uh, that that needs to be discussed but um the, the other way of engaging with yourselves is that we 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 we, we can engage through exchange of documents i can comment on your work and we can have discussions on your work. We can discuss concepts that are a hindrance, as, as uh, Mema Dima said. So today is not the only way of doing. By the way, even if I were to do presentations, I only have uh, up to seven themes. And I know I can break those into small, uh, small pieces, but they will not be 100, they won't be 50. But it will just be few presentations that I can do that would have a number of concepts that we discuss. But the most of the work is when a person has identified a research area and a person is pursuing a research project where the hurdles are encountered. And that is where we need to engage and to try and support each other. So for today, uh, it would be just be a theoretical presentation. Let me, let me for that purpose, uh, allow anybody who would want to ask an introductory question or any other thing that is related to the manner in which we can work together. Um, so we can agree on that as part of our way forward. Uh, whilst students are still uh, pondering uh, or thinking about what to pose, maybe another uh, leading question could be, what is it that they expect from you? What are their expectations? Uh, I know they are on maybe different levels and whatever. But maybe they came with an expectation, um, but then failure of which, if in the absence of any, then uh, maybe you can you can then proceed and then as you present, you can probe some questions that will come. So over to you, students, if you have something or if you have something that you came to say, okay, let me attend this session because this is what I'm expecting. I see Nancy Kelelo said. I, I think for me, yes, I'm a first time a student with UNISA. I've never done any studies with UNISA before. And for me, when I looked at the invitation, I thought uh, this session would be useful. I'm encouraged by the fact that we can engage even after the session because not only am I a first timer with UNISA, but also I had taken a very long break uh, between my master's uh, qualification and my decision to pursue the PhD. And I, I honestly do feel overwhelmed. Uh, there are days when I'm asking myself, what am I doing and why am I doing it? So I think for me, the, the support will come in very handy. And maybe uh, during or after the presentation, one can be able to interact better. Thank you. There's a hand from Masoko Nolo. Thank you very much. Um, from me, on my side, uh, I'm a first time master's student, a young professional, mother of toddlers. And I think when I also saw this invite, I just felt like this is the kind of support that I need because honestly speaking, it is quite overwhelming trying to balance uh, all these other aspects of our lives and still being productive with our studies. So I, I think I'm just looking forward to the journey and learning 
with support because it is a lonely road. You, I've been trying to get other students in the same field, same course, I've been struggling. So at least when there's a support uh, of some sort, I feel that I am not alone on the journey. Thank you, I'm looking forward. There's also another hand from Chris um, Gang. My name is Crystal. Um, when I first inside, um, I actually have a clear guideline of what I'm actually doing. Because I never learned the whole too much. I'm a lot of things to tell a lot of Thank you. Uh, I'm going to continue. And uh, the approach that I'm going to adopt here um, is to present a case study or an example of one of the projects that I did. Um, I will start by presenting some concepts on research process as a part of the introduction and um, make sure that uh, before we adjourn, I, I move to the final uh, part. Um, so I've got a very long uh, presentation from which I'm going to select important concepts and I, I will present. Um, I will choose slides that I think are important for our background and that will also stimulate discussions and the engagement. The learning out outcomes for, for, this, uh, for, for, for this session is to identify and critically analyze basic research concepts. It's also to define research, research methodology, research design, methods and techniques. And the last one, the last outcome is to define, describe and critically compare basic research concepts using different conceptual models as examples. And where if we cannot cover all these outcomes, and we, we can engage in future, or we can have a similar session, or if it is not necessary because I said that this is just an introduction, then we can engage on one-to-one -one with those that would like to engage outside today's session. And um, the definition of research is that um, it is a systematic process of inquiry aimed at obtaining accurate answers to significant and pertinent questions to increase the sum of human knowledge. Um, in other words, we are saying that research is mainly there uh, to assist us um, to gain knowledge. We, we, we did here mention in the definition or of, of, of the, the, the term systematic. In other words, research should be done systematically. And these very slides that you see now, it says the inquiry process is carried out systematically in order to ensure that no facts or processes essential to arriving at correct conclusions will be overlooked. When you are conducting research, it will never be taken as scientific research if it does not follow specific steps that are dictated. Uh, literature is there and uh, principles are there, processes are there that guide research. Different types of research, uh, the use of different techniques, procedures or methods um, will require specific steps in relation to that very uh, approach and that very procedure. Um, later on, when we identify uh, an example, we will be able to see that um, even that example, when it is implemented, it moves along specific step, steps. In other words, it moves along a system. And uh, the, 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 the ultimate results is to ensure that the, uh, the work is um, the scientific product, uh, because there is what we call non-scientific uh, uh, knowledge and scientific knowledge. We'll look at those later on in the forthcoming slides. The, the inquiry is directed at significant and pertinent questions that must um, be asked while analyzing the problem. Um, you will remember that um, every time when you are doing an investigation or a research project, there is a problem or there is a topic that has been identified. So research is to respond to questions on those topic. If there is a hypothesis, some research are there to some some researchers are interested on in actually proving uh, those hypotheses. So sometimes you've got a research problem that you need to respond. So sometimes you've got um, research objectives that you want to, um, to, to 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 achieve. 
and those are part and parcel of the designs, part and parcel of the stages and the steps that must be followed when research is conducted. Now, um, some times ago, I used to believe that uh, research was only meant to, pro to, to solve problems. And I thought that if I'm identifying a research uh, topic, it must be to solve a specific problem. Uh, the true problems that the country is encountering. If it is an organization for which I was working, I thought that I could only investigate things that will assist that organization. But um, there are a lot of literature that indicate that research is not only there to solve problems, but it, it might be there um, to, to do, uh, in, in, in case of contributing to the body of knowledge in a way of generating a theory. Uh, later on, we will see there is a, a definition of applied research and the basic research uh, that will differentiate between which one is used to solve existing problems and which one is, uh, is used um, uh, for the generation of theory. And then we, I just want us to <clears throat> define and, and make a distinction. Um, between knowledge and and um, and information, and um, and the definitions here that I want to read for you is information may be defined as accessible facts or data, but knowledge derives from the coherent organization and interpretation of information within a system of ideas. And, and I know these two statements are here. He or she was communicating to researchers. And the important aspect is to make a distinction between information and, 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 and knowledge. Um, and uh, here it is emphasized that information is not knowledge. It might be factual, it might be true or correct, but it is not um, considered knowledge. Knowledge has got a way in which it is validated, where it is acknowledged. That is why down here I indicated not well, whereas information may stand alone, or as a single concept, knowledge requires the presence of at least two concepts. And the comment says, raw data can be perceived as facts, but analyzed data will become knowledge. Because we know that analyzed data is what would constitute the final thesis or the dissertation that is going to be handed to the institution for examination. So it would have complied with the scientific way in which um, research should be conducted. Uh, now, here, I'm not going to look at this slide, but I want to go to uh, summarize the slide, uh, which talks about, which summarizes what knowledge is. It says, uh, the four statements emphasize that scientific knowledge is inherently collaborative in nature. Uh, it's also based on rigorous and methodological uh, inquiry, and it is evidence-based and inherently skeptical because it treats all knowledge claims to be provisional. And there are important key words there that uh, uh, um, uh, characterize knowledge, the concept of knowledge. One is that it is inherently collaborative in nature. Second, uh, rigorous and methodological. And we've already said uh, it, it is a systematic process in our definition. So that is where rigorousness and meth methodological inquiry comes in. So it is also based on evidence. That is why mo most of the time when people conduct research, they collect evidence that uh, they present and they analyze, and eventually it is translated into knowledge. Now, I just want to indicate, I have been thinking about uh, the meaning of collaborative um, and, and they noted that there's a whole lot of uh, the entire value chain uh, that the research uh, product goes through is very long. And I want to indicate where um, research comes from. Uh, research comes from, uh, if you are collecting um, empirical data, you collect data from informants or people that you are interviewing, interviewees or the respondents. Um, these can be many of them. In some kind of um, uh, research, if the research project is very large, the 
uh, custodians of the research project sometimes appoint uh, field workers who would do interviews and who would collect data on their behalf. And here I indicate if you've got three of them, they might have interviewed different types of people. The other one 20, the other one 50, the other one 30. And I want to show that this data um, to reach the final stage of becoming knowledge, it has to pass a number of gatekeepers. Um, remember I said, if people have been appointed, they are field workers, they, they collect data, but it must be consolidated somewhere. And they take their sets of data to the researcher. If I'm a student, I can be taken as a researcher. Then it's my job to consolidate, to capture the data, to analyze and interpret the, the data. So I would be analyzing and interpreting data from 100 uh, people from where um, data has been collected. And at the back of my mind, remember I would have studied, if I'm a researcher, I've studied literature. If I'm a researcher, I'm the one who designed the project. I've got a problem um, statement that I, I'm, I'm actually investigating. I've got a research topic that I'm investigating. I've got concepts that I've read about the program. And that is, and I'm the one who designed the questionnaire or the instrument to collect data. And when everything comes and is consolidated to me, I do it at that background. And we know that when you do data analysis, you still make a reference to literature. Where literature is consistent, is supporting the findings or the results, the data that has been. This is to indicate that the researcher himself becomes one of the gatekeepers before information that has been, facts that have been collected or information becomes a knowledge. But we know that the researcher has got a supervisor and this supervisor has to, is appointed by the University of South Africa where they've got their own research policies and uh, the University of South Africa share research policies uh, with other universities and these policies should have been approved by government, the Department of Education. So the University of South Africa is also a member of the international community, the research community and the international institution of higher learning. So they share, there are forums where these people share all the information. And it means that information that is presented by the researcher has to comply with a lot of policies, has to comply with the ethical code of conduct. The ethics committee in, 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 um, at, under UNISA should have said, yes, the proposal is fine, it can be used to go and collect data. It would not impact negatively on people who are respondents. So this is just to indicate that there's a whole lot. And even at the end, when you publish or you write a book, uh, we need you to publish something that is credible. Your university must can even appoint an external examiner if it is about a PhD uh, thesis or if, if it is about a master's dissertation. And all these people, I see them as gatekeepers. And you can see that eventually when the thesis has to be passed, it would have been seen and it would have, it would have been seen by many people. It would have passed, passed a lot of hands. And those people are there to validate, to see that, oh, this has been done correctly. That is why when exam, external examiners have gone through the, the report, they give feedback to the institution so that the institution can give feedback to the researcher or to the student, so that the revisions, the necessary recommendations, the issues raised by the external examiners are also uh, actually addressed. So this is how I think uh, research is actually collaborative. I'm, I was just showing one in example on how far you can go if you want to ensure that indeed uh, you comply with the definition of uh, uh, knowledge. So. The features of knowledge require you to do a lot of work because passing all these gatekeepers, you will have to do a lot. That is why for other people, it would even take a year or more than six months to prepare a final proposal because the supervisor just want to make sure that this is an acceptable standard uh, proposal. The proposal complies with all the legislation. It complies with the policies and all the, the standard formats that are required in terms of the scientific inquiry. And if it does not comply, that is why it bounds to and fro. So let me move fast because I'm taking too much time here. So there are specific uh, procedures that have to be followed. We have said it um, when research has to be done. And the slides here 
it's, it's one extract that I've just made to show other faces that a, a person has to undergo, particularly when you're conducting survey research. And I indicate the faces here, we've got three faces on the right and on the left, we have got uh, the steps that have and procedures that have be, to be followed. Theoretical conceptualization of the, the topic under study, it's part of planning, formulation of one or more hypotheses, design of the data collection uh, instruments, um, as well as identification of target population and sample design, all of these belong to planning. But we've got data collection which stands alone as a field administration. This is what you do when you collect empirical data. And data capture, data analysis, uh, interpretation of data, and documentation of the study uh, constitute the last um, uh, stage of data processing, analysis, and documentation. So this is a methodology. Uh, a, a systematic process that must be followed. You do not skip a stage. You do not leave a stage outside. And if you don't do this, then the investigation or the inquiry would not be considered uh, scientific in the way that it is presented here in this presentation. And I've just uh, taken some samples from some of the authors that have uh, written about research methods. So um, social scientists, as opposed to natural and health scientists, conduct research in order to seek answers and understand uh, the social world. So the natural scientists want to understand the natural environment. Therefore, social sciences, scientists follow a different approach in conducting research uh, than natural scientists. There are specific principles that natural scientists learn against, and there are specific principles that social scientists learn against. And then um, the, for an example, the social scientists believe that you must even be closer to the respondents, to the source of information, but um, um, in accordance with their own rigid principles. The natural scientists think that you must detach yourself from the subject under observation so that you can ensure objectivity. Um, so somewhere when you read literature, you would find that there is also commonality between um, uh, the processes of social science research, as well as the processes of a uh, natural science research. Later on, we can discuss about this when time permits. But here, just to say that there's a distinction, there's social research, there's natural research, or other sciences research, uh, other, uh, uh, apart from the social research. But what we're doing here, today we will focus more on our social research. Uh, let me move a little bit. Uh, the definition of social research is um, it is um, uh, the branches of science that deals with the institutions and functioning of human society and with the interpretation, sorry, with the interpersonal relationships of individuals as members of the society. I was just want to leave it there, not um, explaining a lot of it. Now, when you conduct research, I've said that there are specific steps. Now, here is another way in which the logic of conducting research has been put. And somebody has summarized it into product. He says there is a, a, a research problem, as number one. Then there is research design. Then there is empirical evidence and um, conclusions. So this person has identified uh, at least four four stages part of the processes and i i will just want to indicate how it is in this diagram that you see there on the slides um from phase one to phase four and there um there is an unpacking a little bit it shows that phase one where yeah, okay actually I've, I've just repeated what i've said uh, let me skip this one go to the next um slide here they were just explaining what uh, those stages are in details. And uh, I think if you are interested, you can read more about this outside the, uh, the presentation. Uh, now, we, we come to, need, to the need to understand the difference between non-scientific and uh, scientific knowledge. Uh, we have already indicated uh, some, some things that are important. Uh, for a research process to be considered scientific. Uh, now here, we see um, a specification of sources of, of, of scientific knowledge and non-scientific knowledge. 
And the sources of non-scientific knowledge are authority, uh, opinions of peers, tradition, debating. Um, yeah, the, 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 those are the ones. Um, then what they're trying to say is that anything that comes from those sources would not be justified as a scientific knowledge. And I want to just cite one of the examples that they presented the debating. You cannot take the outcomes of a debate as scientific because in debate, you don't have processes that you follow and you don't have the community that uh, ensures that um, the outcomes of the debate actually conforms with a specific scientific approach. So that is why all those uh, sources are not considered as scientific. But the ones that are uh, considered scientific are systematic observation. And we've already spoken about systematic uh, process in conducting research um, and systematic consideration and, and careful elimination of alternative explanations. Here, they just want to indicate that you cannot go to a field with predetermined conclusions and go and select info information that supports your hypothesis. Therefore, that will not be considered uh, uh, scientific. The other one is replication. That what uh, if you have you have uh, followed a specific scientific approach and you arrive at a conclusion, a person who implements the same approach should arrive at least at the same conclusion. Therefore, those are the three criteria that characterize what scientific uh, no, uh, knowledge would, would be accepted. It's, it's replication and it is systematic observation, as we've already said that. The other concept is um, applied research and basic or pure research. And I think earlier on, I've said that uh, applied research is research that is there to solve an existing problem. Uh, but uh, it can also contribute to the generation of theory, scientific theory that can contribute to the body of knowledge. But basic or pure research is research that is there and it is not solving an existing problem, although it can in future uh, solve a problem. But basic and pure research contribute to theory generation. So there are specific times where there's a need to use applied research. For an example, if you are in an organization, uh, um, say for instance, the municipality has got a problem in that the water that they're supplying is not, it's not clean, it's polluted, or it is causing, causing cholera to the residents. So if research has to be conducted for to assist in resolving that problem, then this is referred to as applied research. But if I research something that is not inexistent and uh, my product and outcomes can be used in the future, Therefore, it can be referred to as pure research or basic research. Uh, I want us now to go and uh, talk about research methodology. And uh, I think we... Um, we, 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 we might, I might have touched on, on what research is, uh, but... but Let's continue to engage on this aspect because this is a very important aspect to understand because it is something that will ferry us on the journey to conduct our research and to complete our reports in our research projects. Uh, method methodology um, is a philosophy of the research process or what that which informs the research process. In other words, it is a, 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 a concept that is used to indicate the, the way in which um, research will be conducted. And there's a lot that can be said about this and this, there are different ways of explaining it. But for now, let's just take this statement that we see in here. If there's another better way in which one can explain it, I always want to use simple terms and I want to make myself a layman in the street in order to understand this context, because I know that before I became a researcher or whatever, a student, I was a layman. And if I don't understand these things in the layman's terms, 
I will be unable to implement. That is how I approach research. Research will always be overwhelming people, will always be frightening people. If people take research as a very big thing and as something that is scary, but if we take research as a simple thing and as a lay thing, as something that a layman can be taught to do, then it will be simpler for us. So let's just adopt this uh, description. And if there are other better descriptions that we think we can use, then it's better for us to adopt that. I always tell people that whatever I write in the book is what um, I will be able to defend. I will write what I've studied from literature. And if I'm working with my supervisor, the way to convince the supervisor is to read more, and to make sure that what I write makes sense. That is what I do. I defend my statements that I put there. And I will not defend it by telling him I will write it there to show that it is supported by a number of authors. And that is what I do. So when I have to define research methodology, I will go and look for simple definitions, things that I will not forget, and go and use them to define this terminology. Uh, now, another important aspect is that when you want to choose a research, um, the, the research uh, procedure, or the research method, in order to conduct a, 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 a research for a specific project. That should be informed by the research problem under investigation. It is not every research methodology, sorry, it's not every research uh, method, it's not every research procedure, it's not every research technique that can be used to address, to actually pursue and execute every research pro program. We need to look at the problem. We, we want to look at what we want to achieve and choose the correct methods so that we can be able to achieve our objectives. We will discuss more about this outside and even here when uh, questions can be posed. Uh, now, the other thing that we need to understand is the distinction. Uh, you see, the literature will talk, tell you about the research design, it will talk, tell you about research methods, it will tell you about research techniques. And in some instances, you will find that different authors use terminology of research methods, uh, research techniques, research procedure uh, interchangeably. Um, so it, it, it might even sometimes uh, uh, confuse a person. And what I always do is that I don't want to bog myself into semantics because I just want to read to make sure that I understand what research methods are. I just want to understand what research techniques are and what research design is. I just look for a literature that simplifies it for me and I will use that. Now here, I want us to talk about what a design is. It says, a research design consists of a plan it is a roadmap that allows you to test the validity of your hypothesis or answer your questions, taking into account the factors that you believe might affect the relationship between dependent and independent variables. A research design is simply the way that the researcher proposes to go about testing the hypothesis or answering the research question. When I was, um, I think, uh, two weeks ago, when I was reading literature on this, um, I even equated a research design with a research proposal, because the contents of a research design, we'll see it later on here, is what most of the things that are there are inside the research uh, proposal. So um, I know that um, proposals are different. You have got a proposal to execute a, 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 a research project for uh, the purposes of fulfilling academic qualification. And uh, sometimes you do a project to actually resolve a country's problem, a political problem, or an HIV, a health problem. So the way in which you design your, 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 your inquiry might differ. And even literature also say that some designs would be more specific, some will be very generic. Um, and therefore, it is important for one to understand what you want to write and for what purpose you are designing. You are designing. Here we're talking about the design that is there to assist us to actually produce a research report that will be examined 
uh, by the university so that a, a certain qualification is awarded. So there's a lot that has been written about a research design, and I'm not going there. And I encourage you to go and read. And when you get confused, that is when we can start designing, uh, discussing, and we can agree on how we resolve it, the understanding uh, so that confusion is not uh, continued. <clears throat> Um, I want to move on now. And I want to indicate various um, uh, stages that are followed um, when a project is designed. And I've got a number of them here. They, I'm going to read them as conceptualization stage, um, defining key terms in the study, choosing the research methods, making use of questionnaire or interviews, operationalization or creating concrete measurements techniques, population sampling or making decisions about what and who, sorry, about what and who to study. Stage number seven, observations and collecting the, the empirical data. This is when you're going to the field. And, and, and then stage seven, data processing and, and encoding the answers to questionnaires. And analysis and drawing conclusions to the collected data application. And finally, communicating the findings. This is writing the report. The report to be bound, to be clean, to be edited in good language. And if you look at this, earlier on I presented uh, stages, uh, some of the logical, systematic way in which research should be, uh, uh, be done. And then uh, last week I was looking at the preparation of a proposal and I found there's a similarly, similarity on what I've read here and on what is considered as the content of the, the research proposal. Then it means the research design is closer to a research proposal. Uh, this semantic thing and this the distinction between the two um, we can discuss outside uh, because here if we discuss it, it's going to take us long. Um, but I think the, the author here was using um, a generic team, a generic statement to say a design. A design is a plan, is the guideline, as he said. So one of the guidelines is a research proposal. And that is how I can make a distinction between a, a, a general design and a research proposal for purposes of uh, completing a, 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 a project for qualifications. And um, I want to move and I also want, as we talk about research methods now, and um, I want to say that we do have two paradigms in research. It's the qualitative and the quantitative. And um, in the qualitative paradigm, you use research methods that are different from the quantitative uh, paradigm. But uh, nowadays, there is also a strong emphasis, uh, emphasis on mixing the two paradigms you to to constitute what they call a mixed method um, in triangulation they encourage you to use um, some elements of qualitative um, approach and some element of quantitative approach so that you can benefit later on we can if, if we the slides is there we'll be able to see the benefits of doing so so although the two are different they i've said earlier on that they've got similarities in terms of uh, the, the approach or in terms of the, uh, the process, but there are, um, um, fundamental, there are also differences. So, some, some things that cannot be done on qualitative research and some things that cannot be done on quantitative research. So as we continue, we'll engage more about that. And as we go to our example, we'll be able to see whether it is a qualitative paradigm or it is under the quantitative paradigm. Uh, um, now, here is another description. Uh, qualitative research predominantly seeks explanations. It aims at in-depth description. Whereas quantitative research measures what is what it assumes to be a static reality in the hopes of developing uh, generalization. And um, I was reading another an, 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 another author who has indicated that in terms of quantitative research, um, sorry, uh, indicated that um, in, in quantitative research, you can measure distance, you can measure time, you can measure uh, volume, 
as well. But it has also indicated some variables that can be measured uh, quantitative, quantitatively, quantitatively, but uh, as part of the social research, that you can do social survey, that you can do social research, but still use quantitative measures because you do have quantitative variables that can be measures be measured and they can be part and parcel of the social survey i want to move on uh, now um there i i have a group of um, methods that are uh, there are groups of methods that or designs that mainly belong to quantitative. I've said that, and there are groups of methods that mainly belong to qualitative. And I want to see if I have listed them here so that I don't have to go deep into them. <clears throat> um, for qualitative research, I see there is um, include observation, in-depth interviews, focus groups, and analysis of personal documents. Uh, let me go further and see if I can get examples of quantitative. Uh, yeah, here is quantitative. Let's go to experimental research designs. Um, it has got quasi experimental research designs, time series designs. It has got before and after with control group designs. It has got before and after. That is the same thing. And after only with comparison designs, these are the different types of designs under quantitative paradigm. After and only design, there it is. And there is trend, cohort, sorry, sorry, is trend, cohort, and panel, cross-sectional, there they are. Now let's go and see if they also have listed more of the qualitative, if I've listed more of the qualitative. Uh, here they are. Of the qualitative, these are the research methods under the qualitative ethnographic studies, ground theory, case studies, phenomenological studies. So I did not want us to go deep into those today, but if there is need and if there's anybody interested in any of those, then we can zoom onto those and dig them deep, how they are implemented, how they can be structured, and how they can assist uh, successfully in the execution of a research project. So I just listed as an example of what can constitute a quantitative research paradigm and what can be said to be methods that are under qualitative. And here on, this, on, the, on the slide, I have also presented uh, common research methods and these are under the social paradigm. They are sample surveys, rapid appraisal, um, participant observation, participatory learning, or participatory action plan, action research, sorry, uh, an to uh, unobtrusive methods, the English is going away, specialized methods. And I've just even acknowledged the source where I got them. And anybody who is interested in any of these, we can go deeper onto them, then unpack one by one. By the way, I will be able to unpack one day social survey. I will be able to unpack one day a participatory action research. Today, I will try to unpack what focus groups are and how they are implemented. Here is about triangulation is where uh, I said we mixed methods and I just want to go to the benefits of uh, yeah well, what is the rationale for the triangulation of research methods? I said you can mix the quantitative and the qualitative. They are saying that one of the main reasons for using mixed methods designs is to combine the strength of qualitative and quantitative designs, while at the same time addressing some of the inherent weaknesses of either method. You see, all these methods are good in their own rights, but they've, although they've got strength on their own rights, they also have weaknesses. Now, they are saying that if you combine them, 
you then get the benefits of their strengths as well as addressing the weaknesses. In other words, you strengthen your research approach. So that is the one reason that they, that, 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 that they cite. And they also say mixed methods can be applied at any stage of the design, implementation or analysis of it. So you, you will see later on when I present uh, survey research uh, that um, you, you, improve, you promote triangulation mainly during the um, preparation of the uh, instrument to collect data, uh, the, such as the questionnaire. That is where you ask questions that are quantitative. You can ask questions that are qualitative, open-ended or closed questions um, in terms of what you want to achieve. We will discuss more about this on the day that I present uh, survey research as a data collection instrument. Mm, I want to move fast now. Um, here are the most common, uh, uh, some of the most uh, common um, research methods. I don't know if this uh, is a repetition, but I just want to go through them because here they appear more simpler than what I've seen there, and they are more common to me when I see them than what I've saw, what I've seen in the in the in the table. Um, one, literature search. Two, talking with people. Three, focus groups. Uh, this is what we focus on today. And four personal interviews, five telephone surveys, um, six mail surveys, seven email surveys, and eight internet surveys. These are the methods of collecting data and the methods that we can implement when we uh, conduct research, social research. And we'll zoom into one of them today. And um, so they've got weaknesses, they've got different strengths. So the extent to which one appreciates any one of them, you can use them. But I've, I've seen that um, if you engage with some study leaders or some supervisors, they've got certain preferences. They will prefer specific research methods. And they will advise you in the way that they will be able to support you. I don't know if that is acceptable ethically, but I think that every time when I go to a, a supervisor, I would go with a proposed way in which I want to do my research. And I will continue to defend that this is what I want. And what I've noted is that if you choose an, a research method in accordance with your behavior, you succeed better. You will later on see, I will demonstrate that uh, the use of focus groups is more suited to people who do facilitation, people who, are, who have got social skills, people who like interacting a lot, because facilitation actually requires a people's person. So your, 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 your behavior, your attitude, your preferences, should also assist you in here so that you don't drop the ball because research is a long process and it needs you to concentrate. And if you do things that you don't like, you eventually drop the ball. So although there could be good advices from research leaders, uh, though it is also important to take your interests your interest and your preference into, into consideration. Now, I'm going to look at focus groups. Let me just check how, far we're do how good we're doing with Oh, we still have time. And I think we'll be able to finish these focus groups. Um, I'm going to stop here. Check. I've done the theoretical part, looking at some of the concepts under research processes. And I might have confused or I might have clarified or presented some understandable concepts um, through my communication. So let me pause here. And here, if there are questions or contributions to what I was talking to, before I embark on focus groups, I will do the theory part of focus group, but I will also want to touch on the practical part of it, on the project that I did when I used the methods of focus group in conducting the research, particularly when I was collecting data. Let me pause here for a moment, check, so that you can give other participants an opportunity to talk. And I want to say, uh, in the absence of a hand or any comment, that anybody can interject while I'm presenting. And I think we will be able to engage. Uh, because I also do not enjoy to talk alone. That is what makes me produce 70 and 100 slides. So I don't want that. <laughs> when the class, when, when the session is not vibrant, then a person want, tends to be dominant. I don't want to be dominant. I want to listen to others. I want us to, to be engaging and 
just to have a discussion so that I don't dictate. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, Dr. Korombi, sorry to, yes. to interject. Yes, um, I think students, you need to feel free. Uh, I know that Dr. Korombi today is uh, giving, you know, a, an overview of, of research. But uh, uh, it, it's, it will be very interesting if maybe uh, on a particular aspect you stop him to say, how do we go about here? Um, feel free, because remember, uh, this is your research. You will be facing whatever that you are doing alone. So if you have someone... Uh, Maybe now you are on the initial phase and then you feel like, uh, mm, what have I gotten myself into here? But you know, this is when now you, you need to say, hey, I was stuck here. I can't move here. I don't understand here. <coughs> as much as he's giving an overview, but um, I know that he's still going to come and go step by step and then to say, on the planning phase, because I don't know, Dr. Korombe, I just assume that now, uh, since they are the, you know, the, they are the first entering masters and starting their doctoral, maybe they are still on the on their planning phase to say this is how far we have gone, or if you haven't started now, Dr. Korombe is like paving the way to say, okay, this is what your plan should contain so so please feel free uh, so that uh, you can engage him if any but i'm not coercing you actually i wanted just to give dr korombi to 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 catch his breath because he have been running uh, alone even to sip the water so but in a uh, feel free feel free students um you you have to utilize him stop him where you can i i nearly forgot that i'm not a student i wanted to stop him uh back in 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 some slides back but then i'm like mm, by the way i'm not a, a student so <laughs> no, you should have done that you can do this <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to do that on their behalf, but I'm just I'm just indicating to them to say there was a point where I I wasn't clear, and then I wanted to like interject, but I'm like you you know the owners of the show, uh, let me give them the platform to do that. So feel free, and then um, and there's no you know there's no stupid answer. There is no because this is your journey. This is your you, you have to own whatever that you are doing. So I just wanted to uh, give you that assurance that um, make use of him. You know, it's like when you manage to get somebody that you can abuse, uh, this is the person that you can abuse and then uh, because he is uh, available for you. So you are, you are very lucky uh, to have someone that you can... Uh, you know, it's like a shoulder to cry on, to say, hey, I'm stranded here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Korombi, I was just, I wanted you just to catch your breath and sip the water. Then you can continue. Yes. F thank you. Thank you, Mema Dima. Uh, you know, the, something that we did not do here, uh, I, I, I like this comment that you made. Remember, we, we had a presentation last week. We don't know who of the participants here have attended it. And mm. it was on research proposal. Yes. You see, I you must remember, this is very generic that I'm presenting. But mm. if you go to research proposal, you go to the practicality of it, and that is where problems can be asked. And the progress with, with these people, our group, I actually want to know I don't know if I'm wrong, Mema Dima. I want to know how far they are with their proposals. If they have done it, are they doing chapter two or three? Are they collecting data in the field? Or are they writing the final report? That one I wanted to understand. 
because it will mm -hmm. tell you where support is needed. And when I do a presentation, I would not be at tangent. Now here, I might be out of order because I present whatever I like. Mm -hmm. and that is where we say we need to, to do needs analysis. What yeah. do they want us to focus on? Should we still present a research proposal? Do we discuss it here? Because we can also discuss it one on one, but here it will be good because we will be a group. I will present yeah. it, we attack it, then I show how I've done some research project. And you challenge me on the results that I have. And somewhere where I've missed stages or I've presented a wrong, I've used a wrong concept thinking that it was correct because I, I didn't read correctly or there was an oversight between me and my supervisor as well as the external examiner. And they took my report as something that has contributed to the body of knowledge when we have got an oversight. So mm. in my approach, I want us to interrogate. I don't want to be above anybody. I can be a facilitator, but all of us, we zoom, look at it decisively, tear it into pieces so that when each of us as researchers go out and prepare our own project, we prepare it in a way that it would not delay our progress in achieving our objectives of becoming doctors and masteral students. I want us to understand where each one of them are or where we should focus, in other words. Even if they don't tell us how far they are, they must tell us, let's focus on this section and that and that and that, or on this concept. Then next time I prepare, and that is what we would focus on. This is the first time I agree. We didn't know what, what we didn't know what to do, but today they can we, we can advise each other what these engagements should focus on. Can can we try to do that now? Is it am I out of order or I have to finish the presentation because I have it? I, I thought we must do something that is practical and something that is beneficial to all of us. Not only that I have presented, it's fine, mm. but I am out of course or out of context nobody's benefiting. That mm. is not what we want. We, I must be advised that in future, focus on one, two, three. Or mm. you ask me a question that will hook me because I'm not prepared. I go and read it, then we we'll come and engage. I like that one. Yeah, yeah I think Crystal, it's, um, it's thumbs up. I mean, it's, uh, it's making thumbs up on the point that you're <laughs> making. Um, and uh, you you are right, and as much as we know that they are on different levels, but uh, hence when I was, uh, my opening remarks was that <coughs> we are doing a like needs analysis. What is it that you need? Uh, yes, maybe for a start, for me, I'm not sure if you are out of tangent because you are just giving an overview. Then maybe... In the, sex, in the next session, they will be able now to pinpoint to say, uh, I mean, le they are on this level. Maybe let's start with this particular aspect and then focus on it to say, when we are doing our research proposal, these are the, step, the, the steps that we need to follow. And, and um, I think students, I, I don't want to talk on your behalf. I'm just talking something that uh, Dr. Korombi is also, I'm actually echoing to his statement to say, we don't want to bore you. And then next time you run away to say, ah, you know, those things were generic. S specifics are <coughs> still coming. But today we're just giving an, o an overall, an overview of what research is all about, which you might no, but you know, research, because it's a journey, it's not a, I was telling Dr. Korumbi that a research is a, it's a, it, 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 it's not an event. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a process. It's a long, 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 long journey. So, but uh, the whole idea is that we don't want to say, ah, you know what, I wasted my time. I mean, it's winter now, it's cold. Maybe you will be in your blankets or whatever, but you know, we, we are here. Our purpose is to, to be here for you. And then you are the one who chat your way to say, this is what I need <clears throat> emphasis on. And then you can even do it outside this meeting because uh, Dr. Korombi is always available for you. So I think now as a way forward, um, uh, Dr. Korombi, uh, just wrap up uh, what uh, your, 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 your slides. 
and then the next session, then we will go now specific item by item by item by item. I'm not sure if I'm, <coughs> I'm making sense uh, to you students, because you are the ones who must tell us to say, are we okay? Are we on the right track or not? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Nsiki. Okay. I think let's continue then. Okay. Are they happy in the way that we are doing? Will they advise us outside or whatever? No, uh, so they, they, they are happy. They have, they have thumbs up. I'm sure they are representing even other students. I think we are. Yes. Are, but but you know what, what would be useful is that if they cannot mention it here, let them send information to you and to me that no. we want you to address this and that and that. Mm, mm, that what mm. we are agreeing as a way forward. Yeah. Yes. Okay. There is a. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I was saying maybe after the wrap up, maybe we can just have a short discussion on the way forward. Mm -hmm. Maybe after after when you're done wrapping up. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Um, all right. I'm going to my slides now. And if I don't finish, I will stop on the way. At quarter two, I will pause so that mm -hmm. we can turn the way forward. Twenty-two. At twenty-two. Yeah, so okay. that, yeah. All right, uh, okay. The <clears throat> the next slides are on focus groups. There, I've got what literature says about focus groups. And uh, in between, I tried to source some slides that I prepared. I stole some slides from my, my research work to show you how I've tried to comply with what literature says so that I can be scientific. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, if, if I flow faster enough and if my time doesn't catch up with me, you will see the entire, but even if I don't finish, you can see half. I will stop at 22, but we, you will see what I propose uh, as an, a mode of engaging with yourselves because I present the theory, what literature says, a lot, a lot of authors are supporting, and I then present a slide that shows you, you this is what I've done. Then if I've failed, you are going to tell me, no, there you didn't do it correctly. And if I've passed, you say, hey, yeah, yes, that one is correct. That is what I want. So that this means that you understand or you're following, or actually we we can continue to assist each other in that way. Now, let, let me start with focus groups and what they are. Hey. Uh, <clears throat> these are extended ways of the interview with discussions uh, because interviews can either be one-on-one -on -one or be in groups so they are telling us here that in, uh, focus groups are actually group interviews and go to survey we will even see that interviews sorry focus groups have been mentioned as one way in which groups are interviewed this would be fake so <clears throat> they are in a uh, a structured and organized way with the help of a facilitator or moderator uh, and, uh, to, and, and uh, in other words there is somebody who's facilitating and in this case if it were it, it is you if, if you are a researcher and you are collecting data it means you, it is you a facilitator and if you have appointed other data collectors other interviewers and other field, field work, workers they are the ones who are going to facilitate but later on you would see who they recommend because they think that when you do this work you must have good skills that's why they say it needs a trained moderator in other words if you don't have the skills and you're doubting yourself and you are to collect this data you must first get training or you must ask somebody who is trained to actually be a moderator so that uh, the data collection method is not seen as biased or it does not compromise the integrity of the data that is being collected the participants of the focus group shall be selected individuals with an experience or knowledge about the specific matter and which can contribute. You see, colleagues, you can, <clears throat> you see now what, what they are saying to you here. This statement is actually dictating to you the sampling design that you must do. It says it must be people with knowledgeable about a specific matter. If you do that, this means that you're going to use non-probability sampling design. Later on would um, assist, and I will even show you how I've decided to select people. So 
people must be knowledgeable. So otherwise, if you take people who don't know anything about the topic under investigation, you will not get the data that you want, and therefore you will not succeed in finalizing the report. The pre-planning and design of the discussions, as well as its environment, uh, play an important role in conducting focus group sessions. Focus groups are a carefully planned series of discussions designed to obtain perceptions on a defined area of interest in a permissive non-threatening environment. Because you don't want to scare people, otherwise they will not give you uh, um, the information. And then how do you plan these sessions? Uh, in terms of the venue, the venue for the focus group session should be accessible and convenient to all participants and it should be decided beforehand. Colleagues, there is one thing that I want to mention here, that when you are doing a research, it is for your own interest, particularly if you are doing it um, and you are pursuing studies to develop yourself. You're not doing it for the country per se. And you remember, the people that you are interviewing, people, the focus groups that you're going to establish, are not going to be paid by you. They do, some of them don't even have an interest on what you're studying. So you must not make a venue a difficult place to access. Otherwise, they will not go there. They cannot pay a lot of money in order to access the venue where you are facilitating a topic, uh, collecting data that would not assist them at the end or where they don't see uh, the benefit of attending. So it is important to know that you select a convenient place. It must be central and there, there must be no disturbance, there must be light and ventilation, people must not be affected, become sick or feel squashed, be, be put in a very small room where there are no windows, where there is no ventilation, otherwise they will not be enjoying the, they will even leave the venue before you finish the, uh, the process. Um, here they just discover, dis, uh, describe the, the venue. Secular, informal, I don't care about what it is, but here what they want to promote is that uh, every participant should see you and that every participant should be able to see, to be seen by you. Now, the other thing that is very important is that um, you must inform people of their session in advance. And here I start now with my case study. Uh, when I conducted focus uh, groups, I had one focus group in the Netherlands. And how we made sure that uh, I am accepted and I'm there, I'm met or I meet the respondents. I was meeting the CEOs of the water authorities in, in Holland, in, in the Netherlands. I had to make an appointment on the day that I was on a study tour to, uh, to, to Holland, to Netherlands. Then I used one of the participants to the focus group as a coordinator to coordinate a, a, a group for me and in that is what made sure that on that day and on that specific time we meet at the venue and I facilitated a session and I gathered the first data for the project that I'm going to show you what I've done here and I was investigating um, catchment management agencies in South Africa in the case of an organizational design. So I was studying how these entities were, were designed. So I decided that I will establish focus groups and one of it was established in Holland because there, these people are running entities the same as catchment management agencies. They are water authorities in Holland. In South Africa, we've got water boards and we've got catchment management agencies. So I was researching catchment management agencies. Then I, I wanted similar institutions in Holland and these were uh, the water authorities in Holland, and their CEOs were, were, were interviewed in a focus group. Now, the number and size there, <clears throat> they propose that uh, there is a proposal uh, in some authors that uh, members should be between 6 and 12, but others would argue that there is no specific number that is needed as long as people are there. So others would also say there is no general rule, general principle. But I decided that my people will be between six and 12. And this is what I've done. Um, but the other thing is how many of the focus groups should I have? In order to accomplish my studies, it was for masters of public administration, Northwest University. Uh, I established three focus groups and I found this to be a very cheap methods of collecting data because 
I only had three meetings on three days. And I might have spent not more than two hours per focus group. So in six hours, I was able to collect data for which I completed the master's studies. <clears throat> now, participants, how, how are they selected? Selecting participants for focus groups is a very important and crucial task in order to make it representative. Therefore, the demographics should be considered. You see, I considered that there should be females, there should be the males. And, um, uh, and, and I also um, considered the experience. I considered the gender of the people, the participants that are going to form part and parcel of those three um, uh, focus groups. But in the Netherlands, for unfortunately, I noted that all CEOs were males. And I could not bring females in there. So I failed to achieve a representativity in terms of gender from the Netherlands focus group. At least uh, the two ones that were in, in South Africa, one was in the Limpopo province under the Department of Water and Sanitation. The other one was in Gauteng. In those, I achieved gender equity. And there were different categories of people, managers that execute different water resource and water services, as well as administrative corporate services under those provinces, under the Department of Water and Sanitation. And I knew that they were familiar with the topic under discussion because uh, we have got a specific unit that uh, is going to be ring-fenced, that is going to, to be part and parcel of these agencies, the catchment management agencies that I was studying. So a branch will be ring-fenced, will be taken out to go and join those those entities or to go and be established as, 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 as those entities. So in the Netherlands, the um, benefit was it's long that they've been managing water and it's long that they have established those entities. So um, having all these groups is what's going to help me to collect relevant data on how these institutions should be designed, how the governing board should be and how it should um, have its staff component, its management uh, organogram designed. That was the studies. And I noted that I would benefit from the Netherlands, I would benefit from the South Africans. But I could not achieve the gender equity in there. Um, and these are some of the, 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 uh, um, the, the this is how they, uh, they were made up, though those focus groups, uh, you can see in South Africa, we've got two, We've got Limpopo province, we've got Gauteng province, but in the Netherlands, we only have one. And it has got specific names of entities from where CEOs came. And um, in Gauteng and in Limpopo, respectively, the composition was all the units and the sections that assist in the management and provision of water services to the South Africans in the two respective provinces. So the composition was, was better in South Africa than in the Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Korombi? Yes, ma'am. Just to pose a question. Did you record that uh, disparity in terms of gender as a limitation of your study? Uh, I, I will check. I don't, I might not have recorded, I think. Okay. But I've got some statements that I've captured that were explaining how these teams were composed. And I just made an extract from the research report itself. We will read if it, it has made mentions of gender. And I think if I did not, then we should note from this discussion as one of the shortcomings that we have to avoid when we do research. So it has been an oversight. It might have been an oversight on me, on the promoter, as well as the external examiners. <laughs> so uh, I think you must hold that one until yeah, I come I to the slide. There's a slide that we will, we will reveal if I have disclosed that there has been disparity. <laughs> now, um, now I was coming to a point where there is a statement from one author that the author says, although you have got one group of 12 members, which is a focus group, you can segregate it, maybe have discussions with females on the side and have uh, males on the side, later on combine them. Uh, then I, I decided to show you from one of the, this is not the slide on the on the board there is not part of uh, the investigation that I presented earlier on. It's another investigation, but I will in present to you when I do present another search method. 
when I was conducting my research at uh, Lake Funduzi, um, I, it was under TUT for the DTEC tourism, adventure tourism. Um, I was using similar method. Then I had to establish four uh, research teams. In it, it was part of participatory action research. So we don't call them focus groups because it was a different research method. But the composite, the makeup of the composition, in that we also had to consider gender. Then there is a lot of things that I took into place. Actually, I developed a criteria for inclusion and exclusion of people to be included as part of the study uh, teams. You would see gender, age, land use, resource management, disability, land, and here I did achieve gender equity. And all these criteria that is there, it was even represented. Even the leaders, traditional leaders were represented. They were part and parcel of these study teams. And if I present this one next time, you're going to love it because this is very important. And I tell you that TET has said that my research methods chapter has contributed to the body of knowledge and they hate this one. So this is just to show you that you can segregate. I've segregated these <coughs> focus groups in terms of the geographical locality. But at one stage, I combined them at the Funduzi Development Committee because their specific villages were represented in that committee. Then that is where I presented the study findings and it was validated up there even before I could finalize the report. In the report, I did indicate that although these were segregated in that bigger meeting, I consolidated and the report came out as combined, but it was coming from the different villages. The, the different villages were composed of females, males, resource managers, land users, gender leaders and everybody. So there is a very good, there's been very rich information that has been collected and my report research is 372 pages i was looking at it today and i want to skip this slide and go to the next one uh, now <clears throat> all focus groups should follow the same set of conditions in terms of organization so that it will be reliable to compare the groups this means that whatever you do in each in one of the of, of the uh, focus group you must do in all of them so even the way in which you um, you include um, participants you, you have to develop a criteria and for the for the for the doctoral uh, research i developed a criteria and i have it all those gender and land use uh, developer leadership i just made an extract from that report so i applied the very same in all the four groups i applied the same so in other words they are making sure they are advising that the researcher or the facilitator must not go and uh, collect data in a different way from one group, whereas he has used or she has used a different way in another group. It must be consistent so that data can be validated and it can be credible. Yeah, now I want to show you how we have um, done the establishment of the this focus group, the three of them, uh, the Netherlands one, the Limpopo province, and the Gauteng province under the Department of Water and Sanitation. Now, here, I start with the Netherlands group, focus group. Um, <clears throat> it had four members. Uh, and all of them were executive officials. They represented the water authorities. I've already said that. This focus group was representative of members of the South African Netherlands partnership that served in the Kingfisher project. In other words, we had a project in South Africa where we partnered with the Netherlands. And when I went to the Netherlands to find the people to participate in my study, then I included people who are participating in the project where we are working in partnership. Because they, they would be familiar with the catchment management agencies, our entities in South Africa. They would not be new because my research was on the South African side. So these are the people who know the institutions that I'm, 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 I'm researching. But the benefit is they've been managing older institutions. And here I also indicated that some members acted as advisors to the South, Africa, South African government, so they were included in this uh, focus group. Um, yeah. A table was prepared to indicate name, role, organization, and the gender of each of the Netherlands focus group. Yeah, yes. Now, Mem Hadima, you were asking if I've declared that uh, I've failed to achieve gender parity, equity. 
um, in the in the in the table that I have, I would indicate who is female and who is male. So if I did not make a statement below then, then it should be evident to everybody that here in this table, I don't have females or I've got females. So I, I, I will check and double check if there is a statement that indicates that talks about the demographics, uh, which is very, very important in terms of research. Now, let, let's see how the, the Gauteng focus group was established. The Gauteng focus group had three representatives from the VAL Proto CMA. This is a unit, a branch that will be, be ring fenced and go and join the entity that will be established outside the government, but it will become a parastatal, as, as I've said. The Gauteng Provincial Operations main account of the department uh, had seven members in this focus group. These are the people that will remain in the department to oversee the, the ring fenced group, the ring fenced branch that is going to, to join an entity. So they were also there. So to show you that we've got people from the main account because they used two different budgets. Uh, the, the, the main account used the taxpayers' money to fund the operations in terms of providing water services. But the Proto CMA, the water users pay for the usage and therefore the budget of this team is from water users because we have got licenses, we've got authorizations that are paid for. And this is what constitutes our, our budget. Therefore, we've in included the two types of uh, the, the, the two groups with the different streams of funding in order to operate in water resources and water services. These 10 officials are responsible for the uh, compliance and enforcement of regulation, regional backed infra infrastructure, water sector support services, integrated water resource management, and water use authorizations. This is the core function of the department. But you also have support services, people, staff that were there. Uh, they, they, uh, they, these were information technology support, risk management, strategic planning support, monitoring and evaluation. I think this is generic in many organizations and you might be knowing it. And therefore, I made sure that these are included, the core function and support services, so that when I collect data, data is representative of the feelings and the attitude of all the people who are in the province. A table was also prepared to indicate name, role, organization, and gender of each of the Netherlands focus group. Sorry, this is the Gauteng, the Gauteng group. So it was an error. Uh, the Limpopo Provincial Office focus group was more or less established similar to the Gauteng one. So they, it followed the same criteria and all the units that were there were representative in the way that Gauteng was, uh, was, was, was constituted. Now let's come to the moderator. And this is where I spoke about the choice of a methodology and the behavior of a person and the preferences and the interest of a person. You see, I've got a statement. Your hobby is your career. Your career is your hobby. You should enjoy your job. And therefore, when I do research, I do research on things that I will enjoy, things that I will like. And these things must also contribute to my career. It's not only for me to pass a PhD or a master's or but no, I want to use it in my life because if I'm no longer employed by the Department of Water and Sanitation, I must continue to live and pursue my interest and enjoy. So I want to use my doctorate and my master's skills. So I will use the method that is closer to my heart. Now, that is why I used focus groups. Now, let me tell you now as a researcher uh, what you should do. The moderator facilitates the interaction within a focus group with a set of obviously planned open-ended questions. Here, you prepare an interview guide. In advance, you know what you're going to ask. And colleagues, later on, I will show you how specifically an interview guide differs from a questionnaire. Because these are two different sets of instruments that are used by researchers to collect data. So for the focus group, here we're talking about qualitative research, and you need a tool, a qualitative tool to, to collect data then it is an interview guide because that one has got generic questions. It does not ask you specific questions. It is very important for the moderator to plan opening remarks, uh, questioning sequence, physical setting, and other material. You know if you are organizing a workshop. If you are an organizer of workshops, this is all about workshops. And just take those things into account to ensure that your participants, you, your focus group is actually a, a well, well catered for, and they don't leave you alone, you stand alone without 
anybody to listen to you. Um, now, here is another thing. It is the involvement um, of the, the facilitator and how you make people speak. And I want to tell you that uh, earlier on, we said that if you are not a skilled facilitator, you need a senior moderator or you need a training. It's, it's, it's okay. But um, I, I have made this slide, the red one, from my own uh, perceptions. I observed what the authors have written. And I came out to say that researchers whose occupations are related to facilitation will really enjoy focus group moderation because it is about what they always do on a daily basis. Although it is recommended to use senior moderators at the beginning, this will not always be necessary. If you are skilled in small research projects where there are no facilitators employed, there will be uh, there will be no need for training if the researcher is skilled. In terms of involvement, the researcher must guide focus groups to discuss within context of the research topics. You know what? The, this last statement has been put here because I saw literature saying that uh, you must be less involved in interview groups. And I know that in, 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 in focus groups, people will be talking as they wish. And you don't want people to deviate from the focus. You are collecting data here and you are collecting it for studies and you want to be professional and you want to be scientific. You don't want to collect data that you will not use. It will take your time and it will, be, it will take your time also in analyzing, in, in, in capturing, in analyzing, in synthesizing, in reporting, in summary, in summarizing. And therefore, it is important to know when to interject. When someone is out of course, you must bring them in so that they discuss about the topic on the table. And if they don't know what to, you facilitate to ensure that con discussions continue. People must not keep quiet here because you want information. You are to facilitate to ensure that people give you what you want. You will be having an interview and you know the problems that you are solving. You've got research objectives. Your problems will have been structured and been designed responding to assist you to collect data that contributes to each of the chapters that you have because your chapters will also be in line with objectives so your research questions in terms of the research objectives and your facilitation in terms of the questions that you have put yourself in this in, in a study in a questionnaire interview interview guide Dr. So, Karambi, yes ma'am can i interject um remember yes. i've given you like 10 minutes more remember we said <laughs> let's let's give uh, our students you know to uh, pose you know seeking clarity questions or whatever um yeah, yeah uh, I'm, I'm i'm sorry but i i know that you can talk um, until tomorrow so i'm i'm just with uh, due respect to say can we maybe allow uh, our students uh, to, you know, to pose or maybe, you know, have some engagement because we are left with 10 minutes now. Uh, over to you, uh, Mema Honga, if you're still around to facilitate uh, <coughs> the, the, the students, um, you know, questions or seeking clarity questions or comments or anything. We want to hear their voices now. Thank you. I hope I didn't um, cut you abruptly. Um, yeah. No, I, I'm happy. You see, when we pause here, the way forward will decide whether we will finish next time or we will stop and go to another topic. Then yes. let the discussion also touch on that. What do we do mm. with mm. the program? With the work that we did not finish now because it's not there's nothing that will help us in rushing mm. yes yes sure. i think we better do justice and not leave a stone unturned okay thank you for let's, understanding. Do the mm. let's do the discussion thank you Mama Onga, i still do it. Mm. Uh, I, think you can... I think it's time we open the floor to input. And before I do so, I have a comment 
from the Miss P. when who says, I understand everything you are explaining that far. It makes sense. That's the one comment on the chat box. I know earlier on there were colleagues in the group who said uh, they'd like to give some input towards the end. I think I saw Nancy Gedelo and Matohono. So, ladies, if you still want to say something, the floor is yours. And remember, we will share the recording and these slides for your reference. So you shouldn't panic that there is a lot that we have probably missed. Perhaps <coughs> Thank taking you, a few days time um, next week around Tuesday, Wednesday, you should be getting a, a link for the recording. I think Matloho Nolo wanted Over. to say something. To you, the researchers. Thank you very much. Um, this is Matloho Nolo. Um, okay, like I mentioned earlier, that I am a first time um, or first year master student. Uh, yes, my my mine is my. I'm actually more on the coursework side however we still have to do the we, are, we have to go through the proposal and then uh, the mini dissertation but i do believe that uh, the the understanding of the proposal or the structure is the same no matter whether you're doing a mini or uh, straight research so um i know that maybe we all have different submission dates and timelines on my side i am currently busy with um the proposal i'm in the beginning stage where i'm i'm expected to submit a five page proposal uh, on the 7th of july um yeah so i i i i i my needs are more on yeah understanding especially the methodology i think it's a struggle for me and maybe also tips on how to really analyze literature without wasting time because we don't have much time to be doing everything uh, sometimes we get sleepy as we read and all that so how to be more effective in in some of those things so from now i i would say the proposal uh, well, that's where i am right now and i'd like to get more gain more knowledge on how to do it effectively thank you uh, thanks Put, we will take note of it. Any other addition? We are left with five minutes for our meeting. I can't see any hands. Or you can simply jump in if you'd like to say something. Just to share, where about are you in terms of your own studies? So that we have a general idea. So that people don't get bored, you know. Um, thank, thank you very much and thank you for the presentation talk. I think it's it's quite um, useful. Uh, I'm also, as I said in the beginning, I'm also in the initial stages, uh, which is the proposal stage for for the PhD. Uh, so, and as I said in the beginning, there was a long gap between my master's and now my decision to to resume with the the PhD. So, some of these things, uh, when you look at the pressure at work and the the work that one needs to do, can be overwhelming. So. I found the, the session to be very useful, but I'm also still at the proposal stage. Uh, and, and yeah, it's it's not easy, but I think these sessions are, are quite useful in trying to channel one or assist one in terms of where to, to focus. 
uh, I'm also happy that the recordings would, would be available because sometimes it becomes too much to absorb. But if somebody has got something to always go back to and, and use as a point of reference, it will be very, very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nontigelelo. So the vote leans towards more information on proposal writing and literature review. Having a smart way of handling your literature review so that you don't waste time reading endlessly and end up not using that information. So Dr. Korombi, I take it you have an idea now as to what we can probably lean towards for next week's session. <laughs> yes, um, I think we, let me just be straightforward with them. And I want them to say yes or no, that can we start presenting the research proposal and we deal with everything that is that should be contained in the research proposal. And I know literature is there is part of it and we have to deal with it when we do literature uh, proposal. That presentation on, on proposal was not very long. Um, it, it was just spot on. And I think we can use it as a starter then we go into the, the specific sections of the literature proposal, sorry, of the of the, the research proposal. Is, is that, will, will that be, be fair? Or did you attend, were you there last week when we presented it? Should we present that one? I think we can, we can do it next week. I, I, I might few, have missed last week. Here. Uh, it was a different group for the whole of Gauteng region, so probably that's why you missed it. But this one is specifically focused on Sunnyside students. I have a Louis Moropodi. Yes, um, good evening, um, doctor, and, uh, and uh, the colleagues in the chat group. Um, two things, um, us not being there last week because uh, Work pressures and all. Um, I just wanted to find out if it's possible for the presentations to actually be circulated before the session. Um, last week's session, um, if it can be circulated in anticipation for next week, so that um, we can sort of like go over the the presentations and then have a more engaging session when we do. Um, if 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 that would be possible, that would be great. Then the the interaction would be very. I mean, the engagement would be interactive in that sense. Then the other thing, um, Doc, is it possible to 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 maybe start maybe a bit later? Um, in terms of the time, are we are we strict to say probably five o'clock because some of us during five o'clock are are still trying to get home from work. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I suppose we can schedule for 1800 to 2000 next week, Thursday. For the proposal running writing session. Thank and I much. will I will see if I can get hold of that presentation because it was a different group organizing the session. So much as it was Dr. Korombi presenting, perhaps I would need to first clear it up with the other colleagues who were organizing that other workshop. If the presentation is available, I will definitely share it with this group in preparation for next week. Uh, Ms. Mahungo, can I come yes. in? Yes. Uh, I wanted to suggest that uh, since Dr. Korombi was the presenter, doesn't he has the presentation or you just want um, permission from the, the, the group? I think I need permission because it was not our event. So I don't know whether they are going to be sharing that presentation across the students in Gauteng or not. That is why I'm saying I would need to clear it up with the other colleagues who are organizing that particular workshop. Okay. We should be able to share it even before the workshop on Thursday. If I do get the go ahead. Uh, colleagues, I think we can round off. 
we've kind of agreed that we will be treating the research proposal, incorporating the literature review steps. I will also share this uh, specific presentation as soon as it has been edited, and I expect to be having it probably to a Tuesday. And I will also look out for the one that to share in advance for next week's class at six o'clock to eight. So at this point, I think it's goodbye. And let's meet again next week, Thursday. Thank you very much for joining our session. You really opened our eyes. And like uh, the colleagues have been saying throughout, communicate. You can send me an email or email Dr. Gong directly and copy me because we need to keep records in terms of the consultations that he has done for the students. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much. Chair, yeah, yeah, don't, don't you, I know that you saw, you noted that I was affected by load shading. Uh, I just changed the device. I was using a device that was cut by load shading. I've just used another one now. You, you, I, I hope you have the way forward. I will comply. I will abide by the way forward. Um, yes, I think um, Ms. Mahonga has left. Yeah, we, 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 we had it. And then um, we, I think we'll inform you accordingly. I think what you missed, uh, Dr. Korombi, was that uh, uh, the way forward is that next week, uh, Thursday, and then the session will commence from 18 hours to 20 hours. Yes. So that to accommodate Louis and them, uh, because due to some work commitment. So we, I hope you are also amenable to that, to start at six up until eight. No, Actually, I, I, sub, subject to <laughs> load shading, <laughs> because the, the, our only glitch, uh, Louis, is when uh, Dr. Korombi maybe is hit by load shading. But... Um, we will communicate with you to say, should he have uh, experienced load shading by then, then we can try to move around. We can move the session maybe to Friday or even to Saturday. I, I think uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Korombi is flexible. Actually, that's something that I wanted to even, even propose. To.